Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Show. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, D. Episode Yay. number 133. We should see who can sing our intro the best. Like, can you hit that note? Yeah. Yeah. Now you're black. That's I'm not having an R and B contest with you. Why do you not accept that you're black? I don't understand this. <laughs> Just, Your father is black. Right, me. but he's black. You remember that South Park episode where they just gave a bass guitar to Token and he was like, I don't know how to play this. It was like boom, 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 boom. He was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, anyways. You have hidden skills that you don't know about. That's a, anyway, that R and B intro is not going away. Anytime oh, soon. I like it, man. I like it too. It's very um, good. So we have a like a podcast. Well, first we should mention Corey is traveling, so yeah. there's not going to be too much of a roundtable. And um, we kind of have a podcast guest who's new to podcasting, um, Mrs. Taylor Monahan from My Ether Wallet. Moynihan. Moynihan. Not Moynihan. Monahan. Oh, really? Monahan. Yeah. Okay. I'm wrong there. Yo. Do you only think that you're black when you listen to hip hop music? I mean, are you a little bit mad that I can be selective when I want to be black? You can't be. That's what, that's what I'm telling you. You don't get an option. <laughs> okay. You like I logic. Catch, you're black I and you're white. The moments. You don't get to, you don't get to make that choice. <laughs> Um, right. uh, so yeah, I, I didn't do too bad in the R&B sing off then. I wish I I want to find that guy and thank him, but I forgot who did it for us. I bet you his name is Jacob. <laughs> Anyways, so so what do you think do about quick, my Ether wallet? What do you know about it? This is a quick one, right? Like, are we just gonna get straight into the interview and then release? Yeah, this? we can. I just wanted to know, like, do you know anything about my Ether wallet? I um, know that's where I send. That's where I use Ether. When I buy tokens, it's like the number one Ethereum wallet. It's really good wallet. Holds ERC twenty tokens, which means that most likely, if there's a token, you can hold it with your Ethereum wallet, aka my Ethereum wallet. Um, nice smooth platform. Looks hella good. Um, Corey introduced me to it when we were trying to buy DAO tokens. And we did buy a lot of DAO tokens. And I still have a lot of leftover Ethereum Classic from that. Right on. So, it's actually kind of cool. That's one thing I don't tell people. is like, hey, when Ethereum split from Ethereum Classic, essentially, I, uh, I kind of doubled my money for a little bit. It's crazy. Yeah. But since Ethereum Classic lost that economic bout, I actually am just left with a gaggle of Ethereum Classic that I should I should probably use to buy an Xbox X, Xbox One X. Boo! They don't know how to name gaming systems. It's really messed up. It reminds me of like those AOL screen names you used to choose as a kid, like XX, Xbox X, X One, XX. <laughs> I can't even remember what my screen name was. I'm pretty sure I've been Fergalotti since I was like 13 years old. Yeah, it's it's yeah, 
black sauce or for galati. Yep. The other day, I was actually excited because I have the three I have for galati, black sauce, or 007.5. And I got this credit card so I can get points. I got, I got, so I stay in a lot of hotels by this one chain. So I got a credit card of that chain. So when I'm staying yeah. in these hotels, I get like quad, I get five points per dollar I spend for staying there. So I basically get nights on nights on nights. It's great. So I was like, well, let me get the credit card. Fuck it. And then so I got it. And it was like, what scream name do you want? And I was like, Fergalotti. And it said, Fergalotti's not available. I was like, what? Impossible. <laughs> oh but it said, what about Fergalotti 007? And I was like, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, but don't you want to hunt down this Fergalotti imposter? It's probably like somebody who's trying to beat me. I got to get him. There can only be one. Uh, Anyways, like uh, we are really, whenever Corey's not here, like we refuse to talk about anything crypto related. So let's just get right into the interview. Well, should I tell people about Athena Bitcoin and then we can get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So episode 133 is brought to you by Athena Bitcoin. Is the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs. They're located in Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas. Also, you know, Florida, Chicago, uh, Cincinnati, uh, all over the place. Uh, all you got to do is download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play so you can just figure out specific locations if there's one near you. So for more information, visit AthenaBitcoin.com. They're always adding new locations. And we're also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, BitQuick.co which is the secure, quick, and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get Bitcoin for cash. In as little as three hours, BitQuick has been serving Bitcoiners since 2013. So where there's a bank, there's BitQuick. It's BitQuick. Get your bits quick. It's the most trusted ATM. Yeah. Dude, I got the best compliment ever. My pops says we made a good show. Like he listened to the recent one. Oh, man. Don't tell me that your pops listen to the show because then I'm like going to be, I got I to gotta watch what I say. Yeah, he said we curse too much. I yeah. curse too much specifically. I'm a yeah. pirate. <laughs> I curse a lot. Well, I when you're talking about it. money, like feelings get, they run high. Yeah, man. You got a curse. I get emotional, man. You know me. I get real sensitive about my money. That's my best, uh, what's that movie called? Thunder? With yeah. uh, Ben Stiller and uh, Matthew McConaughey and Tom Cruise. Oh, Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. Like, yeah. I get real sensitive about my foods. Remember that part? <laughs> yeah, I actually just watched that movie on Netflix. <laughs> that movie is amazing. Survive. Anyways, um, let's get into the interview. Qualify right. the folks. Taylor Monahan with my Ether wallet. Here... Wait, you're not gonna like introduce any more than that. Here's no Taylor Gucci. Monahan. Here it is. Gucci. Here it is. All right, today we're here with My Ether Wallet, Taylor from My Ether Wallet. Welcome to the show. I'm really excited to talk to you. Been kind of a fan of what y'all have created and and the service y'all offer to the Ethereum space for so long that it's it's nice to finally have you on the show and and talk about the ridiculousness that's going on and the ridiculousness that will probably continue for the near future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to to be here and talk about some of this crazy, crazy life. Yeah, so um, I guess like some of our listeners aren't Ethereum fans. Some of the listeners are Bitcoiners. Why don't you, for those that don't know what my Ether wallet, why don't you give us an introduction as to what it is, why it got started, what problem it's it's solving, that uh, when how it got so big because it's solving that problem. Um. So my Ether wallet is a client-side browser-based wallet for Ethereum and tokens. And so, you know, essentially what that means is that you can access it via the website or you can, like, download the source and run it locally. Um, but there's no, like, server, central server or anything that stores your keys. So 
um, you basically, it's like a interface almost that allows you to generate a wallet and then you can send your ether, you can send your tokens. Um, we have some other cool features that are like really Ethereum based. So we have, um, the ENS tab, that's where you can get your like Taylor dot F name. And we have like the contract tab, so you can like directly interface with, you know, different smart contracts and stuff. Um, we got started basically because I wasn't comfortable um, with the command line and I really didn't feel like moving like a bunch of ETH around on my, you know, in terminal. So um, my partner, KVH Nuke, he, uh, we used to work together and so he um, basically made me like a button that I could like generate a new wallet and then, you know, send a transaction and it was really basic and ugly and um, quite useful. And so we shared it with some friends and then we posted it on Reddit and then that was like pretty much the end of everything. Like it just blew up from there. Um, I think like, I mean, I think one of the biggest reasons that we got like so big was just, was because of these tokens actually. We like very early in the process um, allowed you to send like any token or add any token. So that was like, you know, just uh, leagues ahead of like jacks and stuff. Um, but yeah, we're dealing with the scaling issues now. Yeah, you're, you have this kind of unique perspective of because, because you've made it so easy for people to get into these ICOs that are kind of the new rave right now. Um, you are the funnel almost now. You, you're, the, you're, the, you're the lowest, I guess, the path of least resistance for getting into these <laughs> Yeah, and... exactly. And I mean, it's, it's awesome, but at the same time, like, there's a long way to go. People, there's a lot of, like, new people entering the space that just don't even understand what a key is. So um, that's a problem. <laughs> and that's something that we're dealing with right now. All right, so, like, like, Let's 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 tap into that. Like, what are the problems that you're seeing from your side? Because you have such a unique perspective of, I guess, the issues that the network faces or the issues that the end user faces because they don't quite understand. So, like, what are, what are the main issues that are happening here? I mean, the main thing is that it's just really new. Even people coming from like the Bitcoin space, there's still new elements of Ethereum that are really, really different. So for one, like the gas and that entire concept is just, it's like not a transaction fee, it's like gas. And Ether is supposed to be like the fuel of the network. It's like the thing that runs the network. And that gas is paid in ETH and it kind of acts as a transaction fee, but it's not exactly the same because even if your transaction fails, you still have to pay for that gas. Then there's like the confusion with like the gas price and the gas limit, which are different. Um, and then, you know, for new users into the space, people who like aren't familiar with Bitcoin or haven't had a Bitcoin wallet or maybe have only been on Coinbase, the issues are like, what is a key and what do I save and how do I save it? And, you know, oh, I really have to remember my password. Oops. You know, people are just so, so familiar with not having like to ever actually save anything. <laughs> there's always a backup. There's always a fallback. There's always someone that will like, you know, answer your email and save the day. And the reality is, is that we are really security minded and we don't have anything. Like we don't save anything. We don't like we, <laughs> we don't save anything. We don't even have logs like on our servers of IP addresses or anything else. We just got the, um, the cool stats that I've been posting on Twitter. Those we got up like, two months ago and it's literally just a count, like a tally of the API calls and that's it. So, you know, it's, it's just different and, um, it's going to be a learning experience and, you know, we're, we're working on a new interface that, sorry, we're working on a new inter, uh, we're working on a new interface right now that will hopefully like, you know, um, basically force new users through a wizard and, you know, educate them about some of this stuff and the importance of backing up their, their keys and remembering their passwords and stuff. Yeah. I was going to mention like, how's a non-developer supposed to know the difference between like a client side or a server side <laughs> wallet? Cause all they see is a website telling them that they have a place to store their stuff 
And even after you explain it, most people aren't going to understand. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've adjusted the front end, especially the generation flow. Like, I mean, constantly since we started, um, We've gone back and forth from having like more warnings to less warnings to trying to really educate the user to like just being like, just save your freaking key. Like, that's it. Um, you can cuss. It's okay. <laughs> the, the, um, like, if you're a new user, the main, the main difference or like the main way that you can tell if you hold your keys or not is like whether or not you have um, something be- besides like a username login username password login situation um Mm -hmm. so like if you're you're going on coinbase you're going to enter your username and you're going to enter your password and you're going to log in it's going to be your traditional form with your forgot password thing with my ether wallet you don't have any of that like you you're just basically dropped onto the site and every time you want to interact with your wallet you have to like select your either your like wallet file or um your like 12 word phrase the bip 39 or whatever phrase um you know, in order to basically complete that single interaction. Man, it's, it's, there's, there's two battles you're fighting here. Uh, well, probably a little more than two, but one is educating the user. The other is, um, other people, like, because you've become so easy, like for me, you are the, the path of least resistance for getting into these ICOs because it's, I can create a wallet. It's specialized for this particular ICO. I can store it away safely. And I know no one has touched it. it like, I have a nice separation of, of funds. Uh, so it's it's perfect for what I'm trying to do. And so because you're that p- path of least resistance, everyone goes through you, which allows people who don't necessarily know what they're doing to invest large amounts of money into something, which lowers the barrier of the types of money that can get into the system because like up until we've created these tools that allow for people like that to get in like we did we had longer icos because the people who had the money were too ignorant to join literally couldn't put money into it yeah and now no, it's true <laughs> everyone can put money into it and they don't necessarily know what they're doing and we you know we both looked at the transaction logs of these ICOs and seeing that like people are throwing ridiculous amounts of money to try and cut in line to get it when you can't cut in line to get it. Like for instance, with Bancor, they set up a, a, a gas price limit so that it was almost like a, you can almost call it a raffle of like the, the miners can't preferentially choose the transactions based on transaction fees. So they were just randomly picking or like it was first come, first serve type of thing. And because of, regardless of that, and regardless of Bancor telling everyone they were doing that, people still threw large transaction fees at them to try and cut in line and just paid a shitload of money to the miners. Yeah, exactly. And, and that sucks. No, like that, it, I mean, it really sucks. Whose fault is that though? Like it's, it's nobody's fault. No, I mean, it's not. It's, it's, you know, it's just... Like we, for for example, we, I changed the interface the night before. So you can't, um, put a gas price above 50 unless you like go through the offline tab, which is more complicated and beyond most users skill. So, you know, for that, I, I mean, I do a lot of things to the interface that are really specific for whatever's happening at the time and whatever support tickets are coming in because like, uh, they come in waves and I, I try to, you know, I try to learn from past experiences. Like I've learned from, there was one ICO where for whatever reason, our gas estimation function, like didn't work. Like, so basically everyone was trying to get in and everyone's, you know, basically everyone's transaction failed due to out of gas. Like the gas limit should have been 150 and it was estimating 90. So, I think I have that you know, I try to, I try to learn from yeah. those things. Um, the, I mean, the other thing is like, they keep changing. Like, so we had our own function, then we use parodies function. Now we're using guests function and they all have contracts that they estimate well for, and they all have contracts that they don't estimate for. So now what I've reverted to is like, literally we have a file that before an ICO, I go in and I, I say, if the user enters this address, automatically set the gas price or the gas limit to be this. And if there needs to be like data, 
you know, give them either fill in the data for them or tell them where they need to go to generate that data. I like, noticed that actually when I when I did a few <laughs> not kind of playing around with trying to pre pre create my transactions is like I put the the contract address for that particular ICO in, and it would pre fill all the correct information that I saw from the white paper or whatever the announcement thing is for all the yeah. time. I was like, oh well, wow, that's that's convenient, and I think a lot of the people who are doing these types of things, like putting incorrect information, are are do, like, trying to create these transactions themselves and then trying to game the system because that's that's the majority of what's going on with these ICOs because this ridiculous hype is going on so much is that people are trying to game the system as much as possible because they can flip the coin as fast as possible for a given profit to the actual users that would like it for the utility of the token. Right. Which is, exactly. in my and, opinion, the underlying problem of all of these things. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that, like, when you when you get to the heart of it, the problem is not necessarily, like, the gas itself or the contracts themselves or even, like, the ICOs themselves or, like, a single investor as an individual themselves. Like, it's this, you know, this kind of ecosystem of just hype and and greed and fear of missing out and you know i think another thing that we have to keep in mind is early investors you know for example if if you got in on the the ethereum presale you bought your eth at like 33 cents so if you've been around for a bit <laughs> you know this price increase is like you know, you may be not necessarily like a whale in life and you're sitting here like, oh yeah, I'll throw a hundred ETH, you know, at this, at this ICL <laughs> because, because you bought, you know, a thousand dollars worth two years ago. And we see the same sorts of things happen in the larger tech bubble and like, um, you know, the, this sort of like situation that happens where, um, you've got like a 27 year old with billions of dollars who's now investing in other companies and whatever that, I don't know if you guys know this, the stupid blender that just came out or the, not the blender, the, pro, the food processor thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. So yeah, there's just like, <laughs> yeah. there's this thing that, that it's like such a startup thing. And it's just like, it basically, so you know how usually you like juice your own juice, like you go get an orange and you juice it. It's like that, except it's a machine that only takes its own pouches of, like, juice. So you basically juice a pouch, and the thing's, like, $600. Baby food processor with pouches is what I'm Googling. That uh, was the first thing that came up. <laughs> I got I to gotta, I gotta hear what you're talking about. Just talk about things until I find this. <laughs> well, you can only, you can only use okay, those Okay, I Googled pouches. this Silicon Valley juicer. <laughs> Is it the squeeze station? No, nope, that's $25. That's not it. Oh, yeah, I got it. I got it. The Juicero. Okay, so they got $120 million in venture capital. And it's like, who, how does this happen? The answer is a bunch of people got lucky and got rich early, and now they're they're looking for somewhere to place their money and somehow this contraption this contraption seemed to be a good idea. Oh, this thing's you ridiculous. Know, it, like it's... We're in the wrong business, Corey. No, I don't know what we're doing. Business. We're in the wrong business. So, I mean, I, there's a term for this. It's called dumb money. And we saw it in the, in the dot-com boom. We saw it in the Bitcoin boom. And a lot of the early investors of Bitcoin who got lucky and made millions of dollars are now funding projects or continue to fund projects in the Bitcoin space that push the ideology of whoever, whatever that person may feel, regardless of you know how smart they may be. And we're seeing it again, but it's almost exacerbated by the kind of multivariate nature of all the different directions you can go with ICO tokens. I can come up with an idea right now, flap an ICO on it, and probably make millions of dollars. If I just, oh, yeah. if I just, if I just have a pretty website and I can, and I know the right type of people that are saying, "Yeah, we'll do that." Yeah, I mean, a lot of people tell us that we should do an ICO, 
And they tell us this for all, you know, they have all sorts of arguments. But the best one that I heard recently was, um, well, you guys are smart and you have like a moral compass and, you know, these idiots are going to throw money at someone for some reason. So you're actually doing like the ecosystem a favor by standing up and letting them throw money at you. And I was just like that kind of, this was maybe a couple months ago. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think everyone's that stupid. Like, I don't think it's that bad. It is. I mean, and then, and then, yeah, it just, I mean, like every single, every single ICO, it's just another, you know, it's frustrating. It's like another slap in the face of like, you know, not a lot of effort being put into these, not a lot of consideration for risk, you know, and I like, my position in Ethereum is like, I am here for the long term. Like I want to build things, you know, for a year, two years, five years from now. Um, and so it sucks when, you know, you see these, these things just pop up and, and out of nowhere just to raise like millions of dollars. What are your, what are your thoughts on the, on the Ethereum bank robbery that just went down? I think it was like 8 million. Is where this they the, just, the free wallet they, thing? Yeah, they drained all the wallets. And then I think it's like 8, it's up to 8 million right now, but it's, it's still going up. I mean, yeah. <sighs> well, it's, I hate it. Like I hate, I don't know. Maybe it's cause like I'm a woman or maybe it's just like how I was raised. But like whenever someone steals something, it makes me really sad. It makes me sad when people lose like their private keys too. Like it's, I'm the worst customer support person ever because <laughs> I'm like right there crying with them. Is it, I mean, is it because people are just relying so much on third parties to protect themselves and they shouldn't or you think it's a bigger issue? I mean, in that case, like the free wallet, like I don't know who they are. Like I never, I've never spoken with them. I've never talked with them. I've never seen them. Like most of the Ethereum community hangs out on Reddit. And so to never see like the founder of a project on Reddit is a big red flag for me. But at the same time, how can you expect an average user who's looking for a phone app to know that quote unquote Ethereum wallet, you know, on the app store is fake or real? And, um, I think that in this case, they were like, like you couldn't come out and just say like, oh, this is a scam that's going to steal your money because they looked like legit and people would put money in them and take money out. And so I think that, you know, most of the like straight up scam wallets are like when they clone our site, it's very easy for people, for me and for everyone, you know, to just spread the warnings everywhere and they're gone the next day. Um, you know, that's what we saw with like Ethereum chamber. They were online for like less than 24 hours. Um, but when you kind of do this middle ground, it's harder. And, you know, I, I think that we just need, like, we need to get a phone app out there, obviously. Well, it's, I don't know. There's, there's, there's a, it's a social change that people aren't accustomed to, right? We've built this, we built the internet on the client server model, which, which garnered a, kind of emergent behavior of delegating your personal responsibility to somebody else. And we, and based on how we built the internet, we, there's a lot of trust involved with delegating personal responsibility to other people. And then blockchain came along and turned that 100, 180% on the, on the, like on its head. You, you no longer can delegate your responsibility to other people, but people who are coming in the space are coming, coming to the space with not understanding that completely. And so it's very, very, very easy to be scanned. And, and Ethereum Chamber is a perfect example of that because most projects are open source just to show the community that understands these things that they are legitimate. But because of that, it's very easy to copy, change a couple, change the front end UI to look legitimate. And if you were honest, you could run a legitimate business based on copying that source code. But, right. or, you just change a few lines and steal a bunch of money if you're not honest. And so, and, and to the end user, it looks the exact same. So reputation yeah. is everything in this space and understanding yeah. is, and not delegating personal responsibility to other people is, is the same. Right. And it's like a cat and mouse game because 
So like a year ago, the biggest issue was these phishing sites that would literally just clone our site and not change anything and run Google ads on like myetherwallet.ca or dot or like with only one L or whatever. Um, and those got a lot of people. And I spent a lot of time like basically doing every sort of like takedown requests, to these different like hosts and Cloudflare and, you know, everyone in between. Um, and then, you know, so we taught people how to check URLs and we taught people how to run it offline and, and on and on, like, don't click ads, like in an ad blocker, don't click ads. You can do this guys. And then these guys pop up and took a completely different approach where they changed the UI, like they changed the color, they gave it new branding. Um, and then they just paid for like whatever press releases and, and to be featured on, on blogs and stuff. And, you know, at, at some level, like I can blame the people that like promoted Ethereum Chamber, but at the same time, like, you, I mean, oh. you have to blame them. Like, you have one to blame our, the freaking scammers. Yeah, one of our one of our our sub shows um, promoted Ethereum Chamber, and it and once he found out it was a scam, it like it made him almost want to quit because he felt so bad because he didn't. Yeah, know. he just didn't know. Yeah, he took and, it pretty hard. And, and it sucks. Like, and it, that's the thing is like, it's like, there's, yeah. I go in circles. Like I want to make Ethereum and crypto more accessible for, for new users. And I want, you know, a diverse user base, and a diverse set of people to be able to interact with this stuff. But at the same time, like some days I do wake up and I just wish that like, our site was ugly and I didn't have any new people that ever wanted to use our site. <laughs> Tough shit. <laughs> like that's not a reality. You know, it, it, <laughs> um, and you know, and I've thought about, like I've thought about, you know, is there something that I should do with the front end to make that barrier to entry to like using our site, you know, harder. And, um, I can't really bring myself to do that, but there are, there are days that I get, I get close. Like just remove all the CSS. Yes, just, just just purposeful, purposeful difficulties. It's like you have technology barriers just to test your 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 education in the space to use our product. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there there are some like really interesting ideas out there, and like I mean, status is a great example of something that I think is like worth building. Like the things that they're doing and the way that they're integrating with different smart contracts and the way their API works and the way that they are essentially going to be like a light client, not like us. Like we have a, we have a centralized node that broadcasts all the transactions. Um, and they're like trying not to do that. So that's good. Um, there's, there's and like that, those sorts of things I think will help, but at the same time, like they're going to run into the same issues that we have because their UI is, is gorgeous, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, that, like, what I like about status is that the ridiculous scope of the utility of their token. It's not a vehicle for speculation. It, it will be. That's not its purpose, though. And you can, like, in order to use the application and all of the splendor that it could be, you would need the token to do all of the different things. And you can do a lot of really cool things that you can't do elsewhere because of the token. That's the point of tokenizing economies. And they're trying to take steps to make, so like, so when you make these, these communities and it, you want to tokenize the community, you need to have a very, you want to try for a, a good disbursement of your token throughout the community. It's like you want everyone who wants to use the platform to be able to get a token and use it. And that's the idea. But with these ICOs, because the way they're structured and the crazy FOMO that's happening. And a lot of investors are making a lot of money. We're seeing very few people have lion shares of the, of the, of the percentages of tokens who act as middlemen when they flip tokens on the open market. The disbursement happens almost on a second layer. And the ICO models are trying to change that. I think status is probably doing the best job with Bancor being a kind of the first the first one to try and change that that's with the capped gas price and they they are distributing like pre-release tokens that have a that will be mapped to 10 percent of whatever they end up raising so if they don't raise a lot 
then there's not a lot that those people get if they raise a ton. I mean, it's it's still only going to be ten percent of the pool, which mm-hmm. means that regardless of how much they give out, those people like they get to contribute, but it's not keeping the people who want to spend a ton of money out of the ICO. And that they've done, I guess, a few other things to try for that, which are novel. But I'm not terribly sure they're going to win. It's just going to do this same type of thing where people throw a shitload of money at the wall and hope something sticks. Right. I mean, I will say that Status is doing an excellent job of like learning from the past ICOs and, um, you know, trying trying to do better. Um, I think that's what we need in this space. Like, I'll I'll give props to anyone who tries, even if they don't succeed. Yeah, I agree. Um, Gnosis, like, is another example of one that, like, they tried, and you can say what they will about, like, what it ended up being, but, you know, people argue that a Dutch auction would, you know, help curb the FOMO, and, you know, instead you ended up with a situation that's, like, so much worse, and I don't think that (laughs) Gnosis, like, wanted, I don't think Gnosis wanted to be in that situation, like, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of speculation that, you know, that that they wanted to end up with a, a large share of the tokens. But I really think that they were trying to, that they figured that nobody would ever, the market never, ever, like, just give them all the tokens. I think um, the only thing they did wrong, or, like, the main thing they did wrong, was set their initial cap too low. It should have been something mm-hmm. absurd. So you could have yeah. natural price discovery. Because yeah, people don't understand what a reverse duck au- Dutch auction is. Like, it, no one understands that. And people who don't even understand the technology that are still throwing a ton of money at this thing aren't going to take the time to look up reverse ducks auction. They're just like, here's a shitload of my money. Hopefully, these tokens make me money. So, yeah. The, I mean, this is like, I mean, one of the problems may be that we need to have, um, like, we need to encourage the ICOs themselves to, like, link to discussion like specific threads where people can discuss openly and it's not necessarily like moderated by the team and like whatever goes goes because there was a really great post on reddit like two days before gnosis that was a screenshot of a spreadsheet where like literally highlighted the top part and was red and it says if we do this this is bad and it had a sad face and it says don't do this like don't if we do this like your tokens basically go to one dollar um they're going to hold like 95% of the tokens, you know, you have to wait here. And if this happens, then we're in a yellow situation with a little straight faced emoji and then all the way to green where like, this is where we should end up, you know? Um, and I think that no matter what your, you like your, your level of understanding was like, that's like a sad, angry face. And that's a happy face. You should be able to understand that. <laughs> We're only speaking through emojis from here on out. All right. All my, so I've been doing analysis blogs, or analysis articles, and they're only going to have emojis from here on out. It's just no, no, no more words. No more words. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, one thing that you did, you kind of like breezed through earlier that I, I wanted to, to touch back on was this, um, this idea that like, uh, I lost it. Hold on. I don't know. It'll come back to me. I don't remember. There's like, there's too much stuff in my head these days. I always wonder like what's stopping another like well-established app to just adopt blockchain technology and offer access to Ethereum services. I mean, they're already going to have a massive user base. Uh, so I, I don't know what's proprietary about the status ICO from What's someone else that just Kick come is in. What's doing, basically? The Kick app? Yeah. So what if Kick adopts the technology? Boom. Right? Oh, communities. It's all about communities. It's, I mean, like you have to build a community that one understands the technology and what it's trying to do and then enable those people to have, like, a token that they can feed back into the system. And if you have a very large community that's using your app for a given thing and then you and you add difficulty to it, they're not going to learn the new difficulty. They're just going to move on to something that's just as easy as what they were doing. You have to have some type of incentivization or thing that they couldn't do beforehand that they'd like to do. 
Now, maybe you can find some type of application that is doing normal traditional infrastructure. What the hell's going on here? Sorry. Normal. <laughs> what are you watching? Uh, my, my, my YouTube just moved on to something else. I was watching what? that stupid juicer movie you, you, you showed us. I knew it. Uh, oh God, sorry. What was that? Yeah, so like, people are gonna people are gonna go where the stake ownership is, though. I mean, just look how resilient Steam is, all because of that little token they give. Is it resilient? Well, yeah. Though? I mean, look at look at Reddit, and that doesn't even have any monetary value, and people That's love just, their karma. Yeah, the, car, the, the karma whore is a thing. It's been a thing. Yeah, it's like the thing. It was even worse like a few years ago. Like I've been on Reddit for way too long, but. Being like a karma whore, being like the the on the leaderboard was like a goal that people really, really, really tried to get to. You don't, I mean, when we talk about incentivization, like you don't have to put money on it. You just have to like give something and then compare people to someone something else. Well, and people's that, time. That's people's it. time is the ultimate scarcity. Like their attention and their time. If you can build an application that will that will bring that will that will make people come to your application. They spend their 